Well, welcome back again. Uh, this will be our tenth session of uh, our painting project, and I've got to say that's making pretty good progress. So I'm going to try to um, do some things today. If we were to review what we've done here briefly in the past, we've been blocking in all the larger areas, and then we uh, went with a uh, after we got some of the fabric done, some of the fruit and part of the cheese stand and the tabletop and the chair, see, we went to a brown color, more of a russet color as it's called, uh, where we mix violet and orange together. And that's how we got this color for these stripes here, also around this uh, window and its uh, uh, trim work and also on the knife handle. And then we varied that or we altered that color by adding some white to it in the previous session here before this one and it made this kind of a mulberry uh, mahogany color and uh, so we've got this kind of interesting uh, alternating uh, brown color working in there for us which should develop into a pretty good painting here so we're going to uh, do some uh, work here today uh, and you should have on a index card in front of you red, yellow, blue, black and white uh, and so a lot of what we do here is simply color mixing and I would like to get back to some of these areas here and I'd like to do the middle of the clock face and perhaps even begin working on the bottle a little bit today as well so if we can get about 35 or 40 minutes of, uh, of work done in this then that will be a, a very good session to start with so I would say let's go ahead and pick up some white uh, paint and I'm simply going to place that on the mixing card here. Now you may not be able to see that until I tilt it, but you can see there's that titanium white is on there. It's probably going to take a couple of dips of this material with a paintbrush there. Now when I put it this way, it's almost invisible to you all. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try to make a cream color, not quite this color here, but just a little bit off white and we're going to put that into the face of the clock here and we will come back to some of the other colors at a later time. Uh, so let's go ahead and make sure your brush is clean whenever you are uh, in group lessons. You've got to understand that you've got to keep your brush clean so that you don't uh, pollute the paint for the next person who may have to use it. If you're in first period, you have to preserve the paint for second period. If you're in second period, I wouldn't feel too worried about it too much if you're an eighth grader. Well, if you're in my second session, that is. So let's go ahead and pick up what appears to be just a small amount of the yellow and if I tilt the card you can see what I'm doing with it and we're going to simply just mix that in to the white and we're attempting to just make kind of a cream color an off color uh, an off white color so it doesn't look so so overwhelming to the viewer when we uh, present them with the face of this clock uh, and many times you have to even paint white areas white when you're making a painting it turns out so that's kind of a that's visible color right there now see that's not too bad and I think I'm just gonna maybe add a tiny tiny speck more yellow to it so if I take just enough yellow to put on the end of the brush there okay and I'm tilting this card so we can see it okay but if it, when you're working with white it's difficult to see on the projection screen and on the camera so that seems to have given me the color I'm looking for there which is just an off white not quite yellow more of a cream color sour cream color I suppose but it's just barely off white now you can kind of see it in the camera here I'm going to lay it down a little bit farther away so it's a little more visible but it's just not quite yellow if it's this color right here you need to add more white to it so I'm going to leave my card on there so we can see what's happening here and we're just going to you know pretty quickly and pretty freely paint in uh, the round portion of the clock we're not going to paint anything that's obscured by the glass right now we will come back to that uh, you will probably be able to surmise that uh, the glass will uh, show colors through it and uh, that is a whole nother series of problems to work with and so we're going to save that for a while here now this cream color at which base is made with this titanium white has a great amount of concealing power meaning if you've got like a uh, not necessarily round clock face there well this is the time that you can kind of fix that a little bit by over painting it which is something that we talked about in the last session so I'm going to just carefully try to cover up 
any portion of my clock there very carefully so it appears to be more roundy. And uh, that's a good thing, really. Now, when you're working with white paint, it can bleach out your vision a lot of times. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're going to a more calming color here, this uh, cream color. So I'm going to just try to just very carefully manipulate the paint with the end of the brush so that what I get uh, will uh, kind of tighten up any of the loose control that I may have here uh, with the, you know, the circular nature of this clock. Some people when they uh, draw circles, uh, they use a pattern for that and that keeps a lot of problems from happening. A lot of people will also use a compass and I think uh, uh, that's what I would recommend to most people. Now if you've got the skills to draw a free-handed circle and it comes out looking circular, then that's a tremendous skill. And uh, you're somehow gifted, uh, but uh, my drawing experience in the past has mainly uh, I used implements such as compasses and patterns uh, having come from a background in a drawing and drafting more than a background in painting and uh, fine art. Uh, so when I entered the uh, field of teaching art uh, my background in drawing really heavily influenced my painting style. Uh, so I have this hard edge painting style where I pretty much tuck all the colors right up next to each other. I don't often smear colors together. It's just not in my uh, artistic uh, toolkit. It's just something I never really been able to do. Smear colors together in such a manner that they're attractive. I've been able to smear colors together before, but generally it was a mistake I was making. Uh, so yeah, some people can uh, do that. Uh, I had this one young lady that was in a class I was taking as an adult, and everything she did came out perfect. She could have dragged her sleeve through the middle of a painting and then sneezed on it, and it would have still come out looking pretty good. So some people just have got that natural uh, acumen, that natural ability to do things that the rest of us find nearly impossible. And she was one of those individuals. I marveled at watching her paint. Um, and so, when you are taking painting classes, you've got to be aware of the fact that, you know, there's more than one style of painting. There's more than one technique of painting. So, uh, we discussed those in our uh, notes earlier and so one of the techniques is pointillism and some people turn that into their own personalized style there that would be using just the finest point of the brush to make a series of dots and dashes and that's how you would visually mix colors together optical color mixing uh, whereas we generally just mix it uh, on a card sometimes you can get away with mixing it right on the painting sometimes and we might experiment with some of that Okay, so I've got my nice off-white color there, cream color uh, showing up here, and so it's about time to move on to something else if I've got a nice round-looking clock face up there. And you can certainly tell that there is a difference in these uh, two colors because this is the white canvas showing through, and this is definitely showing up as more of a yellowish, slightly tinted yellow color. Okay, so that means uh, we're done with that. Let's go ahead and rinse out our paintbrush. And we're going to uh, perform a, a bit of a similar uh, task here. And we're going to work on the bottom of this bowl. Now eventually we will have to add some shadows so it doesn't make our bowl look like it's floating above the fabric there. And the same thing goes for some of the uh, other objects in this painting as well. So uh, when I look where I want to go next, this, this has been bugging me for some time down there. So once again we're going to use more tinting. Tinting is the is the uh, process of lightening a color by adding white to it. And so if we do uh, a bit of what we call reverse tinting, where we're just going to take the white, and I'm putting a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, servings of white right here onto my index card that I use to mix with. And you should have an index card in front of you for mixing, and an index card that you use for uh, paint that, that holds your primary colors, the red, yellow, and blue, and black and white. So I've got my, you know, 
serving of white paint right here. Now I'm going to take just a little bit of the blue and like I did with the cream color I'm going to mix it together in a tight little pile here so that I can get the appropriate color of blue uh, similar to the bowl that we painted some time ago in one of the previous sessions. Now this is a little bit too light as you can probably see so it's you know I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more blue to it and it doesn't take very much I'm just putting a little bit on the end of the brush and then I'm stirring this so that I can sweep it all together in a kind of a, a tight little pile like it was sand. Now you may notice that this, the body of this paint is really rather heavy and thick like toothpaste and so it's not so easy to scrape it together sometimes because it's very gluey. Any residue that's still on your brush like that scrap of blue that's got to be included into the uh, paint. Otherwise what happens is your paint begins to change colors because of residue in your brush. I'm going to compare these two and it looks like the one on the card is still a little bit lighter so that is going to call for another uh, small serving of the blue. Now here's the thing about making paint and when you're mixing up paint. Uh, you can you know, always add more of a color but once it's in there you really can't take it out and then attempting to continue to go back and forth with the white paint and then more blue and it just never really comes out so you just got to kind of stick with uh, the color that you're attempting to make and then do it in small steps so this is getting a little closer I would say it looks like it needs just a touch more blue so once again not very much blue just enough to do the job here so let's scrape all that together. Now if you smear all this around on the card, what is going to happen is you're going to get the perfect color, but it's going to dry on that card and you'll never be able to get it to uh, work. And you know, we've always got to make enough paint so that we can uh, finish the area that we're, the target area that we're trying to work in. So I like to scrape it into a tight little pile. Now let's see if that's getting pretty close, isn't it? Probably one more speck of blue is going to be appropriate and uh, I have not used very much paint here I have a tendency myself personally to not mix up enough paint and so uh, I think that's because I'm a teacher and I just can't stand to see people wasting things like paint and so I have been very very conservative over the years about how I use paint but that causes some problems meaning I have to try to make up more of the exact same color and man that can be very Using. That looks pretty good. I think we're going to go with that color right now. It's very close and that means we could uh, we can alter that color a little bit later. So let's uh, take this color and we're going to tuck it up right next to the previous color. We could leave a tiny little halo around it so that we can go back and maybe trim it with a slightly different color. But I can tell that these are just slightly different colors anyway. And so I'm going to try to be brave enough to tuck these colors right up next to each other. But if you're a little bit hesitant, then you need to leave that little microscopic halo like we did here between some of these images so that later on we can go around with a maybe a dark colored paint and touch that up a little bit so we can see clearly where one color meets the next color. Now you might be finding too that when your brush is dry and it's a good thing to have a dry brush but when your brush is dry uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get the paint to come off the brush and so you have to load the brush with a pretty good serving of paint in order to be able to not scratch your way along you know, and scuff up your painting. Now, that would be a technique called scumbling, which is a legitimate technique, a method for running the paintbrush. However, it's not, if it's not what you're attempting to do, then people tend to get a little frustrated with it. Okay, this is working out pretty well. Now, I try to paint quick enough so that you all can see how the painting will develop but then again, I don't want to get so fast at this that I uh, make mistakes that I can't easily correct. And so by going slow and accurately, that's how you end up with a painting eventually that looks good. So when you 
get real rushed in anything, I think most people would agree that's really not the best way to do anything. I mean, even cooking your breakfast uh, would be, and you might get really unexpected results when you try to rush through things like that. Uh, so it's, this is a almost a philosophy. Uh, painting is not just an activity. It's a way that people approach what they do in the world. And uh, some people, you know, really are good at things and they succeed at them simply because they have a natural talent for them. Other people, though, uh, learn material or learn skills along the way. And uh, I was not naturally a painter. It took me years to become comfortable with painting. Uh, it just didn't have the exact type of uh, accurate marking that I was used to from being from a drawing background. And uh, being from a drafting mechanical drawing background, uh, everything uh, that we drew in those classes when I was in high school had to be super accurate. And uh, that has left me with a lifelong uh, dilemma about you know getting loosened up when I want to get creative. Although my work is is highly planned out, and uh, that tends to uh, cause me to work in a more uh, controlled and deliberate manner. Uh, but it's not so expressive, and so I. One of the things I would like to be able to learn is how to be more expressive instead of, you know, spending so much time simply sweating all the tiny details that go into doing any sort of artwork. Because the details will really give you fits. Okay, that's looking pretty good so far, I gotta say. And so that matches pretty closely the color that we've got on the body of the uh, bowl that holds the fruit. So I'm going to go ahead and rinse out my paintbrush and then I'm going to dry it out on a paper towel that I have off camera here. And if you, uh, when you're drying out your paintbrush, if you're careful with it, you can keep a very nice sharp point on it as you can see right there. Now if you're abusive to your paintbrush you're just going to get something that won't give you accurate marks. Okay that gives us a chance now to start thinking about moving on to other large objects in our painting right now and I guess the time has come to deal with the uh, stand for the cheese uh, or the cake. It depends on what kind of a, a, a structure you have going there. Now I'm going to, since we've got this black circular uh, object up here, I think I'm going to go ahead and stick with black and we're going to put it right on the very edge of this right here and in this circle in the very middle of it all. So I'm doing my best to try to keep it simple uh, but also attractive. And so you want to have a, a good color balance. So if you have a little bit of a color up here, you need to try to find some of it and put it down here. If you're going to have, you know, the green here, we probably, you know, a little bit of green here, maybe a green bottle as well. So what I'm doing constantly when I make a painting is I'm looking around in the painting and I'm trying to balance the colors out so there's a little bit of, you know, good color everywhere. So, and black is a good way to set off a color so it makes it look uh, a little bit uh, even though it's black and it soaks up color it also stands out strong against uh, some of the other colors in the, that are in the painting as well so we're going to carefully begin this and we've got to tuck all these colors together accurately so if you're just you know slinging the paint on there and like a young child would well, sure, that's expressive, but it is, uh, it's sometimes not very accurate. And we're trying to make, at the eighth grade level, you all should be mature enough to take your artwork serious enough, if you're in this class, that you want to make accurate markings with your paintbrush. And sometimes we use other implements for painting with, too, things such as palette knives. And well, sometimes you inadvertently use stuff like your sleeve and these things can <laughs> sometimes be detrimental to the beauty of your work. Okay, now I have to very carefully tuck that together there. So we're making some progress and 
So you get, just got to get used to the idea that a good piece of artwork may take a while to create. And so this paint that I'm using is really pretty heavy, meaning it's uh, very gluey. Now the thing is, if your paint is way too gluey, and you can't seem to get it to move around the way you want it to, well then you should probably uh, take a little bit of water and melt down a little bit of the um, paint that's in a little puddle on your index card. And if you do that, the paint will get a little bit more fluid. It will be a little more like ink and a little bit less like, you know, gummed up paint. But, you know, you can always just slow down the work you're doing so that you good, get good accurate markings. And uh, that's really my best advice for everybody is to just slow down and enjoy what you're doing and make good artwork slowly instead of bad artwork recklessly and fast. We used to do a painting of the covered bridge. Uh, we had a covered bridge painting in my classroom and we also had oh a painting of a, some musical instruments and a drum set and, and then we also had the lighthouse painting and after many years we narrowed it down to just doing the lighthouse or the covered bridge. And then, you know, I just got tired of seeing the same paintings all the time. And it turns out people uh, have these paintings from their children, their brothers and sisters, actually hanging in their house. So, um, I've been told numerous times by parents, hey, I've got that painting hanging in my house, even though it's in our classroom here. Um, so I'm like, wow, that makes me, makes me feel good. If uh, anybody thought that a piece of artwork that their child made or that they made was good enough to hang on the wall of a home, well, that's, you know, that's a pretty good achievement for a student. It's a pretty good achievement for anybody that you make uh, something that you would like to hang on the wall of your home. Uh, I have, my house has many of my own pieces of artwork in it and some of them I am really proud of. They've taken, you know, weeks and months at some times to paint. And uh, when I was done with those, uh, some of them have been entered into contest. Sometimes they failed miserably, even though I liked the painting. Sometimes they won awards. Other times uh, I've sold some of those paintings. So, you know, I'm proud to to make a good quality piece of work and it's satisfying to have it in your house where you can look at it all the time and uh, that's a good thing if you can master the the techniques and you can understand how the materials work okay now this is taking just a little bit of technical detail work right there and uh, I'm just going to keep on working on the black and if you're painting faster than me either you're a great painter or you're just going too fast and I try to be very deliberate about my placement of the paint uh, I really don't like to go back and try to fix paintings especially if they have it sounds like we still got the bells going on around here. So sometimes you hear everything happening in the background in a school building here. Alright, so the black edge of this cheese stand or cake stand is looking pretty good. I'm going to do my best to just close down that tiny little halo there. Alright, now while I'm at it, there is a tiny little bit of black goes above the knife handle. And there's also this... Uh, these rivets in there that hold the knife blade in the handle. So we want to make those nice and circular. And then on the end of the knife too we've got the, the flat end on the end of our knife there. And that should be more of an oval shape. So, now you got to be careful when you're painting too, especially if you can't see the brush making the exact mark you want it. You might need to really kind of 
back up a little bit and really just be careful with the brush. Get the point very, uh, the tip of the brush very pointy and then as accurately as you can and it takes, some, it takes control to do these fine markings. Sometimes you got it, some days, especially when I've been drinking a lot of coffee, I have to take a deep breath and hold my breath to calm my, calm my painting nerves down. Okay, I'm probably just going to have to live with that because it doesn't seem to be getting any better right now. So I will simply leave that alone and perhaps come back and touch it up at a later time. Now the last little portion of this is right here above the knife handle, if you can see that. Now you may notice my hand is completely upside down, but that's because I'm standing on the other side of the camera right now. And so when I'm making an instructional video, I can't really just uh, turn my painting upside down, which is what I would recommend that you all do, since you are sitting at a work table, probably somewhere but I can't just go flipping it around. Uh, people would be so confused and dizzy by the time I explained what I was doing that they might not completely understand. Okay, let's see what we've got there. I'm going to say I need to leave that alone because that's looking pretty good. Okay, we can go ahead now and maybe move on to this portion in the middle, the uh, little uh, round uh, spherical object that holds all of this together in the middle there and so using some straight up jet black here. I'm going to do the same thing. Now because of the way this is foreshortened it will look a little bit like a, a smiley face at the top and the bottom. Now if you remember from drawing unit foreshortening is this idea about how things get changed in their appearance as you move them in space. So, for instance, the top of the stand here, it's got the cheese on it, or the cake, if you want to think of it that way. We know it's round, but when we uh, manipulate it and move it in space, then it starts to look like an oval or an elliptical surface. So, uh, that phenomenon is called foreshortening. Foreshortening is kind of the uh, concept that you know, the soccer ball that gets kicked on one side of the field looks very small, but then about the moment it hits you in the face, it looks very large all of a sudden. So that is what foreshortening is. It's how an object changes its appearance uh, as it's moved through space. And so a circle, when it is turned at an angle, will appear to us to be an elliptical or, or oval shape. All right, now this is starting to come together pretty nicely here. Gonna really tuck all this together carefully and maintain my spherical shape. All right, so it's starting to look pretty nice there. So it just is, a, it's really just a, a struggle between wanting to go fast and get done and wanting to make good artwork. And when you uh, get into a rush, you tend to make bad judgments about things. So this is pretty good. I'm going to probably just have to quit messing with it in order to get it to look the way I want it. Now people ask me frequently, you know, how it is that I get good paintings. And the actual truth is that I go slowly. And so some of you may be painting way out in front of me because you paint fast. But I would rather have you paint good than paint fast. So paint good and slow. Meet your deadlines and your due dates. And you're never going to have a problem with stuff. at least in visual arts classes, that's for sure. All right, well, that's looking pretty good, too. So, you know, we've made up a few colors here already today, and we've filled in some areas of our painting, and it's starting to actually look like a legit painting at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and rinse the black out of my paintbrush. 
and then I'm going to work on I think the knife blade next and I'm going to do that uh, through uh, color blending rather than color mixing and color blending is where we would, might take a color and lay down a coat of it and then we go back while that paint is still wet and then we smear another color in on top of it and in this case we want this knife blade to look gray so it simulates some sort of metal and so we're going to start by taking some white paint and we're going to undercoat it in white and uh, on depending on how what size your painting is is going to determine how much of the white you need so I gotta be careful not to lay my hand in this uh, not dry uh, black that's already on there. So I'm going to go ahead and if you paint things in one section at a time you end up with a much better result. And, uh, so I'm going to paint in this top portion of the knife blade right now. And before that white paint that I just put down here has a chance to dry I'm going to pick up the tiniest tiniest speck of black on the very extreme point of my brush and then I am going to blend it in to the white paint. Now I gotta be careful not to lay my hand in already existing paint and this should give us a gray effect here. And if you're using just the tiniest amount of you can put more black into the gray if you don't like the way it's coming out but once you put too much in there you're going to have something that's not quite the right color so when you're using black it's just a struggle to avoid over using it uh, and then you know having something that is so dark that it's soaking up all the colors that are around it and that tends to you know affect the beauty of your work so black it can be used you know a lot in a piece of artwork however uh, if you get too too liberal with it what happens is that it starts to just soak up color and it diminishes the beauty of your work rather than enhancing it so in the previous session, or maybe two sessions ago, I was explaining about outlining things in black, which is a, a stylistic choice that a lot of artists have made over the many decades, centuries of making paintings, I suppose. Uh, Van Gogh outlined a lot of things in black. Picasso used black frequently in his own artwork. All right, so we have the top portion of our knife blade there. and. I'm going to attempt to make a lighter coat of this. That little speck of black right there is messing with my mind, so I need to get that taken care of. There we go. And just try to smooth it down onto that marking in the preparatory sketch. Alright, we're getting somewhere here. We're working slow, but quality work is being done. Okay, so now I've got that blade and it should be maybe even a lighter color of this gray. <clears throat> so that means we're going to have to rinse out our paintbrush and make sure it's clean. And then we're going to pick up a little bit more white just for that very, very, very edge. And then we're going to do the same operation with even a smaller amount of black this time so a micro spec of it so I'm putting some white paint on my paintbrush right now that might be too much because this is kind of a small object in the painting I'm doing I gotta look around make sure I'm not about to put my hand in wet paint otherwise you just have to learn how to float your hand above the painting or you have to bridge across it by bracing your hand against uh, on either side and then just really putting your fist down and bridging across the work. Now sometimes the paintbrush and the paint itself will pick up some of the residue of the pencil marking as well. Ooh, that's kind of tricky right there. And that can also give you a bit of a gray effect as well. 
Alright, now I'm trying to tuck this white right up next to that line in the preparatory sketch. And it looks like I've got it. And I've got, while my white paint is still setting up before it dries, I am going to take the tiniest, tiniest amount of black and I'm going to place it on to the painting here. So that requires me to take that white off the end of my brush and uh, that bell, man, the time goes by fast when you're painting. So it indicates that we've been at this for about 35 minutes. I have got the tiniest, tiniest little speck of black on there and then I'm going to touch it against my paper towel just so I don't have very much in it. And then let's see if we can make this a slightly, slightly lighter shade of gray. And we should probably, I guess, start up here, shouldn't we? And now it's, it's starting to work. Now there's times I may have to go back and work a little bit more of that black paint into this gray I'm attempting to make. But we only need just tiny, tiny bits of it. So even the small parts of the painting take a long time to paint in sometimes. Okay, it does appear to be slightly, well, it's, it's kind of hard to get the right exact, ah, here we go, let's see if we can't get this to work. I may have to retouch it again here eventually, and that's part of making a painting too, is that you're constantly going back and trying to fix things. That didn't quite work out exactly like you thought they would. All right, uh, it's kind of working there, I'm getting the effect I want, and I may have to just take the tiniest bit of white paint and go back over this tiny little blade of the knife so I can trim it up just a tiny bit. Okay, I'm getting the gray. In the gray. Alright, so let's see what's on the. Well, you know, that looks pretty good. I, maybe I will just rinse out my brush just a bit, pick up just the tiniest amount of the white, and see what happens when I try to make sure you're not laying your hand in wet paint. And what starts to happen here if I. There we go. Now we're getting a light, lighter gray. So people many times ask me, Mr. Mathis, is gray a tint of white, a tint of black, or a shade of white? And that's a, oh, well, that's a tough question to answer, really, but uh, when you're using black and white, you're really kind of practicing a, a monochrome.